Okay. Uh, thanks everyone for joining and thanks to, um, for the, to all the organizers for organizing this terrific event. I'm gonna really quickly now summarize uh, the main ideas that are in a much longer talk that you can see on YouTube. So as uh, Tom mentioned, I'll be focusing on the inner region of the disc, the region within 10 EU. And let's see, where's my mouse? I hope you can see it. Uh, the region within 10 AU and the outer region of the disk will be covered in the talk by Laura. So even though the inner region is this really tiny region, only 10 AU in size, it's still an important region because this range of orbital radii out to 10 AU is overlaps the orbital distances of many of the known exoplanet populations. And so we'd be pretty curious to know what's going on in this region of the disk at the epoch when these planets are forming. So here's a quick schematic of what that looks like, uh, not to scale. Most of the inner 10 AU is made up by the disk and material here is spiraling in from the outer disk to the inner disk, eventually making its way onto the star where it grabs onto stellar magnetic field lines and crashes onto the stellar surface. It generates an accretion shock and a UV excess and the UV excess shines back on the magnetosphere, which causes it to glow in atomic lines. And then it uh, back out here in the disk, we can observe the disk, both in the dust continuum emission that it produces, as well as molecular line emission that you can see that comes from the heated disk surface. So today, let's chat really quickly about some of the diagnostics that are available to us to study this entire region from the UV through the infrared. And I'll mention a few things that we can do by studying stellar accretion rates and what we can do to learn about uh, important things about planet formation, the lifetime of disks and the planet formation status of some disks. We'll also have a quick look at what we can do by studying disks themselves, the emission, the molecular line emission that they produce and how that can be used to study the dynamics structure and chemistry of disks in this region, which gives us some interesting clues about planet formation. So starting now with those diagnostics, if we look at a spectrum of a T Tauri star from say 3000 angstroms here at the shortest wavelength down through the K band, we subtract out the star, which is let's say that's this dashed line here, then we have what's a, a near infrared excess out here, which is coming from the very inner region of the disk. We have a UV excess over here, which is coming from the accretion shock, and many emission lines, some of which come from the magnetosphere and others which come from winds. If we were to go to even shorter wavelengths, we would come to the far UV, and there are a number of really interesting diagnostics there that I summarized in the longer talk. And if we go to longer wavelengths out to the mid-infrared, there'll be some interesting diagnostics there too that I'll summarize in just a moment. But for now, let's just have a look at what we can learn about what's going on in this system from looking at probes of stellar accretion, both the UV excess and some of these emission lines. All right, so one simple thing which has already come up yesterday is the lifetime of disks. And um, as probably already mentioned, one way to look at that is to look at the near infrared excess and to ask every star in a cluster of different ages uh, whether they have a near infrared excess and we find that it's decreasing with time. But you can also do that by asking, how many stars in a cluster are also accreting with time? And the fraction of stars that are accreting is also declining with a similar E folding time of a few million years. And that's the basis for the simple statement that the lifetime of inner disks is a few million years. So if we wanna use inner disks to help us do something to make planets or move them around, we need to work quickly because we've only got a couple million years to work with. We can also use stellar accretion rates to learn about what's going on in disks. Uh, for example, if we look at this group of stars called transition uh, disks, which have uh, spectral energy distributions that tell us that their inner regions are optically thin in the continuum, you can imagine a number of different scenarios to explain that. These disks could be in a very early phase of planet formation, having just made planetesimals. They could be in a late phase of planet formation, having made giant planets, or maybe they're not making any planets at all. And even though all of these ideas can explain the spectral energy distributions, we can get some insights into what's actually going on in these systems by measuring their stellar accretion rates. So if you plot stellar accretion rate versus disk mass, we find that transition objects live here compared to 
normal T Tauri stars. And that location gives us a clue that the most likely explanation for these kinds of transition objects are, has something to do with the formation of giant planets. So even though we're measuring something about stars, we can also learn something about disks. So now let's turn to some of the diagnostics that we can use of the disks themselves. Uh, there's the UV transitions of molecular hydrogen as well, but here I'm gonna focus mostly on the infrared diagnostics. And some of those include the CO overtone lines in the K band, the CO fundamental lines in the M band, and in the L band and the mid infrared, we have many transitions of water and organic molecules, which can be used to probe this dynamics, structure, and chemistry. So what are some of the things that we can do with this suite of diagnostics? One idea is to use high resolution spectroscopy. This is a really good um, tool to have in our, in our toolkit. And reason for that is that the orbital distances that, we're, that are of interest here within 10 AU, when you put it at the distance of the nearest star forming regions is still a very small angular scale that's diff difficult to resolve directly. So we can get sort of higher resolution to uh, see those regions by using the fact that disks rotate differentially. So rapidly rotating stuff will produce their emission at large radii and slower rotating stuff at smaller radii. And so by dispersing the, uh, dispersing the line emissions of function velocity, we can reconstruct some information about the spatial information. So one simple illustration of that idea is if we take the line profiles of T Tauri stars and we measure the maximum velocity, which translates into the smallest uh, orbital distance, we can measure the inner radii of gas disks. And that distribution looks kind of similar to what we find for orbiting the orbital radii of extrasolar planets. And the reason for that might be something quite reasonable that, disk, that planets may form at very large radii, couple to their disks and migrate on in until they come to the end of the disk and then they stop. And in that way, the structure of protoplanetary disks can imprint themselves on the architectures of extrasolar planets. Now, this is just an illustration of something we can do to get higher angular resolution using spectroscopy. But what if we want even more, we want more angular resolution? Well, that's where this, spec this technique called spectroastrometry can be pretty useful. Uh, and let's see, let's have a quick look at how that works. One of the things that's really great about it is you don't need any new technology. So the idea is that when you disperse um, the line profile, you wanna measure at each velocity, the spatial centroid as well. So if we look here, the spatial centroid would go from close in for purple out to large for blue, back this way for yellow and then into red producing this very familiar S curve. But you might wonder, wow, could I detect something else beyond this typical disk thing? Let's say I had an orbiting circumplanetary disk. Uh, maybe that would produce an emission that I could hope to detect. And you would expect to see an excess of emission at the right velocity. You would expect this extra source of emission to alter the spectroastrometric curve. And in the longer version of this talk, I illustrated how one can detect using this technique uh, an orbiting source of emission that orbits at the positions and velocities of a source in Keplerian orbit within the optically thin region of this transition disk that also happens to have the emitting area of a circumplanetary disk. So it walks like a duck, talks like a duck. Mm, maybe it could be a circumplanetary disk, but this is just to illustrate how to find something that's that tiny inside this region you could use the super resolution of spectroastrometry. And the magic here is really just that you can spatially centroid to greater accuracy than your angular resolution. That's a good technique when you have simple velocity fields. So now I wanna to turn to um, a different technique, uh, which is chemistry. Can we, maybe this is somewhat of an underappreciated tool, but can we uh, try to decode the chemical signatures that are encoded in mid-infrared molecular spectra. And you might be interested in that because when we look at the mid-infrared spectra of disks, they're very rich. There's lots of features here. We've got features of water, emission features of acetylene and hydrogen cyanide, and many other things. And you might wonder what could we do with that? Well, one thing that this group of diagnostics right here, water and organic molecules are good for, is to probe a changing C to O ratio in the disk. 
because as the C2 ratio rises, we expect the abundances of organic molecules to go up and the abundances of water to decline. And that ratio of organics to water should be very sensitive uh, to uh, a changing C2 ratio. And you might further think that disks would uh, alter their C2O ratios as a result of planet formation. So if disks are building the building blocks of planets, uh, planetesimals and protoplanets, they would lock up water beyond the snow line, which means that the material that accretes in past the snow line would be increasingly carbon rich and that formation would, would alter the C2O ratio. In the longer talk, I explained how this simple scenario is, seems to be what we see when we actually look at Spitzer data. We have or ratios of organics to water that vary and are correlated with this mass. And that's the kind of correlation that you would expect to see if planetesimal and protoplanet formation was well underway at the age of something like Taurus, a couple million years. And in that way, chemistry can potentially uniquely illuminate what would otherwise be a very elusive planet formation process. Because when we look at disks like this, and I think Laura will tell us more about that, we can use these, these structures to tell us whether planets are forming. But if we wanted to know how they're forming, whether they were formed by planetesimals and other important ideas in core accretion, the, these images can't really tell us that. And so that's where chemistry might come in in providing some new insights. So keep that keep chemistry in mind as a potential tool in your own work. Um, now, just for something a little different, I wanted to illustrate how as um, a totally different kind of tool is just about ourselves as people mm -hmm. and the idea to keep an, always keep an open mind about, be open to serendipity. probed region of the spectrum, you can always find something interesting there. So although most T Tauri stars look like this, although most T Tauri stars look like this with, with a lot of emission features, some of them are oddballs, and they show absorption features of those same molecules. So here's acetylene and ATN and absorption and CO2 and absorption. And if you take a high resolution spectrum of this source to see what's going on there, you find that the absorption features are all red shifted by a significant amount, four to 20 kilometers per second. And if you analyze these absorption features, as I described in the longer talk, everything about the absorption looks just like what you saw in emission. There's the right temperature, there's the right abundances. Only difference is that it's an absorption and it has these really high supersonic inflow velocities. So it's just like we were looking at the disk atmosphere that if we were looking from above would produce emission, but we're looking at it almost edge on. So we see it in absorption. And with these supersonic velocities that if you calculate the accretion rate, it's the T Tauri accretion rate. So the material that would eventually make its way onto the star that we were studying, that we were discussing at the very beginning here, seems to be transported just through the tiny disk atmosphere. And so one interesting outcome of this might be a, a picture about how we can have our cake and eat it too, that the very surface regions of disks and just in their atmospheres may be the part that transports material toward the star in a fast surface current, leaving behind a deep ocean of quiescent material that's very hospitable to planet formation. So a little new insight that comes from just taking a spectrum and seeing what's there. Okay, so that's it, um, no more time. So here's my summary. We had a quick look at the range of uh, diagnostics that are available to us from the UV to the infrared. We also had a look at some of the things we can learn by studying stellar accretion rates to learn about planet formation. Even though it's about the star, you can still learn about the planets. Um, and also uh, some direct observations of the disks themselves and what their structure, chemistry, and dynamics can, uh, how that can be used to learn new things Okay, uh, thank you, Joan. That was a really beautiful talk. And I, I really recommend that everyone go look at Joan's extended talk. Uh, it's, it's a really fascinating uh, and, and really beautifully done talk. Uh, also, I should say that we will be, uh, they will be answering questions in the third 15 minutes of this. So please, people, please start asking questions and 
they'll be answered as we talk and we'll have a chance to discuss them with the, uh, the speakers later on. Okay, so our, our second talk, now we're gonna move into the outer disc and lower wavelengths to the submillimeter and millimeter. Uh, and we have Laura Perez from the University of Chile. Uh, please take it, Laura. Thank also, you, please. Tom. <clears throat> okay, uh, thank you for the organizers for this opportunity to come tell you about how do we probe the outer disks uh, um, using different techniques, observations, and different diagnostics. And to begin, what we really need uh, is to look at a schematic view of a protoplanetary disk because the different components that we observe are not collocated. We have a flare gaseous disk that extends quite broadly and a midplane with solids that are actually more compact and vertically it's very settled. Okay, And so we have to use different techniques and different ways of observing this so that we can probe the full outer disk. And for this, multi-wavelength observations are critical as they provide these constraints on the structure and distribution of the material. And this is because there are density and temperature gradients in a protoplanetary, protoplanetary disk. Closer to a star is warmer, as you get further away it's colder, the density is higher closer in, as you go further away it's less dense, and vertically it's very cold but very dense in the midplane, and the atmosphere is much warmer as, as it is directly illuminated and uh, is much less dense. <clears throat> and this creates um, um, a, um, a possibility to explore the full extent of the outer disk with different wavelengths. In particular, by going to long wavelengths, uh, you should be able to probe closer to the midplane and more uh, of the cold outer disk, as I will discuss in a minute. And for this, I really recommend the hands-on session that the Sagan organizers have prepared because it really will give you a good understanding of the how do you modify this structure and what I just have discussed on average and what will be different then from what you get out in the realm of possible observations. So there are two parts of my talk. I will give five different examples in total on how do we probe different disk regions. In the first part, we're focusing on how do we probe the cold outer disk and the mid plane. And for this, we need to go to longer wavelengths. And here's a nice diagram that explains why. As a function of um, the distance to a central star on the x-axis here, uh, as you get further and further away, but also vertically in the disk. So in the y-axis, you have the C direction. And if you think, where in the disk is the emission that I'm seeing? If you go to a chart wavelengths, you know, the near infrared and the far infrared, you're mostly probing the atmosphere of the disk. As you see, these colors are high up compared to where you want to be, theta of zero or close to zero, which will be the mid plane. And it's only when you go to long wavelengths that you're able to probe this. And what is interesting is that if you also were to plot where most of the mass, the bulk of the mass comes from, it also comes from the same region that is being probed by long wavelength observations, the cold outer disk near the midplane. And so we can, for example, use this to our advantage and infer disk masses from thermal emission at long wavelengths. And if you go to see the full length of the talk, you will understand what are the standard assumptions that we use to convert the observed flux to dust masses. And so here, for example, in this if, um, uh, ALMA set of ALMA observations uh, probing a, a, a large region, what you will see is that some disks are bright, some disks are faint, and this is a direct probe of a less massive disk or a more massive disk. You could also construct um, uh, a, a, a cumulative fraction of disk mass for different regions, okay? And in generally, in general, what you see is that the younger regions pile up up here, and it, on average, you know, at the 50% level, they have more massive disks. And when you go to the more evolved regions, the older regions, what you see is that at the 50% level, the available disk mass is about an order of, ma of magnitude smaller. And so this is something important that we can directly learn from, from ALMA observations. 
Another important aspect, so this is example number two, is that you can obtain dust properties. Again, I invite you to look at what these assumptions are that we have to make, but you can infer from the spectral index of emission the properties of the dust grains, including the fact that grains appear larger and more evolved compared to the ISM. And for example, when you look then at the spectral index of emission from a large number of disks, this is, this is a plot of, of, uh, of exactly that, what you see is that this, the interstellar medium, which is mostly composed of very small dust grain, has a spectral indices that are quite large. Yeah, exactly. And when you look at protoplanetary disks, is that you see this large uh, grain, sorry, these lower spectral index values and thus a larger grain sizes. And something that you can do even better with ALMA is that you can obtain resolved observations. So measure the spectral index, but measure it as a function of radius. And what you can obtain there is constraints on the dust properties and the amount of solid mass uh, as, a function, as a function of the different substructures, for example, that you observe. Here are TW Hydra observations at 3 AU resolution. Okay, so done at multiple wavelengths from about 0.9 millimeters all the way to three millimeters. And if you model the emerging intensity, you also forget about all the standard assumption and actually uh, think about rate of transfer, uh, including its scattering, et cetera. You can compute the observed intensity in this multi-wavelength uh, set of observation and constrain important things related to the dust temperature the amount of mass in the disk, this will be the middle panel. And finally, the properties of the dust grains, for example, the maximum grain size. And you can do connections of the observed properties of what you see in the rings versus the gaps. And I will not discuss this because we will hear more on the talk about this on dust grain evolution. And I also invite you to look at the recorded talks there. And something that has been transformational in the past, you know, several years now, is that at long wavelength emission, we have this really powerful instrument, ALMA, that has uh, the required sensitivity and angular resolution for us to constrain substructures uh, on the mid plane of the disk at long wavelengths. And here's a nice gallery of ALMA images at AU resolution. And just uh, to, to just mention a few things of what we have learned here is that when you look at substructure, it seems that the most common one is rings and gaps. Some young disks even have substructure. So the early stages, when you trace the midplane, you even start seeing this. You start seeing spiral substructure and also asymmetric substructure. And I will like to say here that there will be a talk on exactly this topic and how will you perhaps explain uh, this wide variety of observations and the statistics that we're now starting to, to compile um, later on today as well and on the YouTube channel. And I wanted to just point out that uh, there's a lot that you might want to learn if you want to do your own ALMA imaging. And there's also a lot of opportunity now uh, to, since a lot of, uh, in this new world, everything has been recorded, to learn about this from interferometry and synthesis imaging schools all over the world, really in Europe, in the US, etc., cetera, um, Australia, I'm sure as well doing uh, ALMA imaging and learning, uh, or sorry, teaching about, about these topics. So two more examples. How do we probe then the outer disk, but the two parts that I have not discussed, the disk surface and the gaseous components. And to do this, what you do is scatter light. So photons that come from the central star, we scatter off the surface of the disk in uh, from small dust grains located in these regions. and uh, we can pick up their, their emission, and their emission is related to properties of the dust grains, the properties of the actual outer disk in terms of structures. And you can go see the full talk to, to see the breadth of things that one can do. I will just show one example right now. You can also um, probe the gaseous components of, of the disk, and depending on the optical depth of these lines, you can probe the surface 
as well as more closer to the mid plane, depending on the tracer that you choose. And I just wanted to show an example of how different then these three ways to trace the outer disk may look like with just one disk. So here is HD 143006 in thermal emission, uh, you know, a collection of rings, a big gap, a large asymmetry. And then when we probe the surface of the disk in a very highly optically thick emission line, CO, for example, we see it's actually quite symmetric and it extends much further out than the uh, mid-plane uh, thermal emission. And then when you look at it in scatter light, it even looks <laughs> even more different than any of those two. And, and so this just shows you that you need to go to probe these other tracers if you want to understand what is going on. And of course, I will not be able to do any justice to the gas and chemistry in protoplanetary disk. So please uh, see the talk that, that Karin has prepared um, on the YouTube channel, but also right now in this session. And so the fourth example is that we can constrain the vertical and radial structure from scattered light emission. And this is because the emission that we observe is very sensitive uh, to the illumination from the central star. And if you have, for example, an inner disk that is misaligned in the simulation from the outer disk, you might start seeing shadows because some of that inner disk blocks the emission from the central star. And this can get very fancy. And for example, there's this beautiful set of observations that actually don't look like these two simulations because you need to start adding complexity into this radial structure and vertical structure. And in this case, for example, you need not only an inner disk misaligned, but also a ring misaligned with the inner disk and the outer disk. If you want to reproduce, and you see here in the bottom, what is their prediction? Um, and so you change the disk structure and you're able to constrain what is happening. Um, finally, the final example of things that you can do to probe the outer disk is that with long wavelength molecular line emission as uh, John very nicely sh has shown today, uh, you can probe the velocity field. And the velocity field to first order should be Ke Keplerian. But if something is happening, for example, there are planets embedded in the disk that are perturbing the velocity field, well, you should see some deviations from Keplerian motions. And these perturbations are not necessarily due to planets. You could also have perturbations in a disk due to, for example, a very massive disk that undergoes gravitational instabilities. And then um, compared to just a regular disk, which is here on the bottom, you excite all these extra additional perturbations that are quite large, actually, they're quite obvious in, in the disk. And we are starting to see with these new ALMA observations that you can find localized perturbations or you can find these large scale perturbations and they might be a signpost of these processes happening in, in the disk. So to just conclude, what can we learn from the outer disk by probing these different components? Well, if you probe the submillimeter emission, you're probing properties of the large solids and the disk structure. If you're probing infrared scatter light that comes off the, the scattering of uh, the, the stellar radiation of the dust grains in the surface, well, you will be probing the structure of the disk, but also the properties of those small grains. And if you're probing a, a long wavelength molecular line emission, then you're able to probe not only the structure and kinematics, but also gas properties chemistry in a disk. And with this, I stop and thank the organizers. Well, thank you very much, um, Laura. And also, I just remind everyone that Laura also has a really beautiful talk, full length on, on um, if you haven't seen it, you should go take a look at it. So now we have um, 15 minutes, roughly, where we can have a discussion. Um, basically, if you have a question, please type it in. There's actually sort of this frantic activity going on that makes it a little bit hard to, uh, to sort of manage a sort of question and answer period because people are literally answering the questions on the fly. But let me start with one. Uh, from Joan, which I think is a really interesting one. Um, we, we know that planets migrate and they migrate inwards. And we have these, for example, hot Jupiters that are very close to their stars. And that migration, of course, requires gas. 
So on the other hand, we have this sort of inner region where because of magnetospheric accretion, the gas is cleared. Uh, so we have sort of like a edge to the inner disk. Um, what can you say about the relationship between sort of where the inner disk falls and where we actually see planets? Is, do they sort of correlate or is there a problem there? I'm sort of extra extending a few questions that I've seen. Right. Um, so the interesting thing is that when like the first um, planet that was discovered, 51 Peg, uh, ended up, you know, it's a hot Jupiter and it ends up very close to what at the time uh, people thought would be the inner disk edge. And so um, when I think it, I think it still bears out when you look at the exoplanet statistics today. So I showed one of the plots was the you know known exoplanet populations and that there's a lot of hot Jupiters there. And if you look at the orbital radii of the hot Jupiters and the inferred uh, inner radii of planet protoplanetary disks, they're quite similar. Uh, and so the there's a you know idea that uh, planets would couple to disks and migrate in. Uh, along with the accretion, and I guess you know, once they pass the inner edge of the disk, there's they can't exchange angular momentum, so they would stop migrating. So that idea seems to be um, borne out by the by the comparison of the exoplanet orbital radii and disk radii. But if if others know more about that, I'd be glad to um, hear about it. Okay, thank you. Um, one other question. Uh, this one's for Laura. Um, there, there's there's uh, two questions, but let me just start with one. First, how do you what constraints do you put on the distribution of surface densities? And and so there's a little bit of question of of how the surface density decrease is related to the flaring of the disk, but then there's a larger question of how the, the density of the disk decreases with radius and and what what do your measurements say about that? So people have compared the, the surface density of disks as a function of radius for different uh, disks. And I didn't include this, this in my talk for the sake of time, but I certainly recommend some of the latest reviews that have come in the field, for example, where you can measure this from, uh, uh, from the dust thermal emission. And what you see is that not all of the disks are actually quite massive and maybe even massive enough to form something like our own solar system. So, so we can compare this minimum mass solar nebula to the constraints that we obtain in surface density, uh, for example, for disks. And it's really uh, uh, you know, the brightest ones, of course, that we observe that may even reach these sort of masses. And a very important unknown that we have is that we don't know if um, you know the, the fact that we're probing solid maps mass probes directly the disk surface density that is dominated by the gas. And I think this is one of the biggest un unknowns right now. And, and for this, we have to do really you know, a big effort that relates the sort of chemical measurements that, that will be shown today as well by, by carrying over that, that shows what type of constraints can we make on actually where there is the bulk of the mass uh, because measuring mass is not easy um, as, as we have discussed before. And so, yes, so I will say it's rare to find disks that are as massive as we will need it for, to form our own solar system. And at the same time, um, Maybe the reason for this is that evolution has happened. So a lot of the mass already went into planet and we're looking at not planet forming, uh, but planet hosting disks. Although they, they, these uh, planets are growing, you know, they're not so proto <laughs> as we think them to be. And so I think there are a lot of unknowns here that, that uh, you know, we're with the with new sets of observations, which we are starting to get a better handle on. One th thank you. One, one, one other question that has come up on a slightly different topic is you, you show these beautiful data on this, these misaligned disks, which are fascinating. Um, and I was wondering, do you have, are there some mechanisms that have been proposed uh, for those disks? What, what can cause the misalignment? So I think, I think uh, uh, in principle, you shouldn't have a very big misalignment. All of these should sort of damp down as a, as a function of time. 
But even small misalign misalignments can uh, happen dynamically. For example, if you have uh, binary systems, for example, or if you have a very massive uh, planet already there, it could misalign the inner disk regions. And um, I think we might hear about this in, in the planet disk interaction uh, talk, for example, um, where different mechanisms uh, are proposed to explain this. But this is actually becoming relatively common uh, uh, to find disks for which the inner disk and the outer disk are not quite in, in the same place. And actually, there, this maybe is even common when people have looked at the deepers. I don't know, Joan, the deepers are this range of disks. I don't know if, if, if from, from the inner disk, people have made these constraints before. So, so they, they were these disks for which their light curves deep dramatically. And so you assume, okay, this is a very edge on disk, so edge on that you know, the light from the star is being blocked by material every now and then. And then when people have looked directly at the outer disk of these objects, uh, they find that they are not edge on. They're you know, in, in a completely different configuration. And so constraints from the inner disk that were obtained uh, early on uh, have shown that it's completely different uh, from what the outer disk says. I don't know, John, if you want to add more than my two cents on this. No, I agree. I totally agree that there's a lot of evidence for uh, misalignments or more complex structure than uh, you know just a simple planar disk. And mm -hmm. when you know you'd think just as you said that it's most disks should be pretty flat, and maybe once in a while there'll be some misalignment for some reason it might be a binary or something. But when people find a lot of misalignments, which is sort of like a story that I you know anecdotally kind of been hearing. It's a little disturbing. Um, either <laughs> either we're, there's something we're totally missing and something new to discover, which is pretty interesting. So I don't know whether this will come up in the session, like you said, on, on uh, disk dynamics, but I uh, just wanted to mention that it's, um, everyone should you know, keep an eye on that because that might be a really important area for discovery. I, I, let, let me just, uh, um, since, since I'm the chair, I could ask this question. I, I thought that there was one model for the dippers. So the dippers are these objects where there's a, a very steep dip in the light curve um, in the optical and also infrared. And that, so it comes down and comes back up. I thought there was some evidence that some of the dippers may actually be from the accretion flows, that they might be occulting part of the accretion flows that are further out as opposed to part of the disk. Is, is that a viable model, Joan? I think it is for some things like AA tau, where uh, I think there's a fairly good model for that, where, you know, like the magnetosphere, it, kind of covers the star. And so if it covers part of the star, you can expect this to shadow the, the accretion flow or the star periodically you might get a dipper like that. But I think there's a lot of other things as, as systems as Laura mentioned, where you really don't expect that to work out so easily. And um, they're, they're, just, they're just a lot of the kind of dippers that have disks that are totally not in the right alignment. So um, maybe it all works out, but I think they're, it's not it's not straightforward so uh, i hope there's someone here who's an expert on this topic who could say more but um i think it's a really fascinating uh, area okay remember everyone uh to keep typing in questions uh let me again this sort of summarizes i think a few questions joan you mentioned these these really neat measurements where you can actually measure the flow of gas inward um, can you just talk very briefly uh, from the sort of observer's perspective about the mechanisms uh, that by which gas flows inward and what constraints this measurement might actually put on those? Is it sort of consistent with standard models? And what are those models? Yeah, that's I a good that's question. All... No, no, no. It, so this is like, this is a whole whole main topic. Like how do disks accrete? Like we always say they're accreting, I'm spiraling in, blah, blah, blah. But you know, what is the mechanism that makes that happen? For a long time, people thought it was a mean rotational instability, but yeah, we don't, just don't have enough ionization for that kind of angular momentum transport. So, um, uh, you know, people may have mentioned the idea that disk winds can transport angular momentum, or there may be some other, but still magnetically related uh, kinds of angular momentum transport mechanisms. Whether the angular momentum goes back in the disk or goes out in the wind, you need to remove the angular momentum so material can make its way onto the star. And it turns out 
that, so even though, you know, for to make magnetic uh, mechanisms work, you have to work more or less with the disk surface because that's where the ionization is. And it's just a question of how small in a region do you have to work with? So people, when you think cosmic rays, it was like a really thick region, X-rays smaller, UV even smaller. And so the idea that you could transport most of the mass through the disk at a very tiny area is saying that the region where the you know, UV and very, um, the UV dominated region could potentially be the, the region that transports angular momentum. And supersonic um, inflows, even though I didn't expect that to, to detect those, are actually predicted in uh, various models of MHD interaction. So the, some work that Shining Bai did, uh, if you look closely, that they do, he does predict supersonic accretion flows. And then other work that Jahan Zhu and um, Jim Stone and, and other people have done also predict that kind of effect. So potentially these observations, you know, through a very special viewing geometry, uh, give us some observational confirmation that those kinds of flows really can occur. Well, thank you. Um, uh, let's see, one other question. Let me, let me, uh, sorry, in the last few minutes, let me, um, send one uh, to Laura, I'm sort of summarizing a few, but there was a few discussions about how the disk properties might ma um, vary with the mass of the star itself. And so I, I know you've, you've done a lot of different surveys. Have you actually looked into how the properties depend on mass, uh, at least from the perspective of the outer disk? I mean, they, not not myself, but there have there are several results in the field where, where uh, for example, when uh, when you look at different disk properties, you're able to, to say something, uh, some relation. Uh, for example, the, the disk sizes, uh, uh, we, we sometimes find uh, this type of, of correlations with the, the outer disk size and the luminosity that we observe, for example. So fainter disk seem to be smaller. And uh, these, it's interesting because the vast majority of disks are the fainter disks. When you look at this beautiful Alma gallery full of substructure, they are beasts <laughs> in a way. They, they are the tail of those distribution of masses that I was showing you. And so it's important to know what happened to the more common disks. And, and for that, for example, we don't have questions already read. Okay, um, we don't know about the type of substructures that we see in, in large number of disks that are more common uh, related to their mass, for example. Um, I wanted to ask uh, Tom, it, since we had prepared a little poll with, with Joan, and I don't know, Joan, if you want to introduce this because we have a minute and a half. Oh, go ahead, I, please. Okay, um, we had we had uh, two questions. Uh, one was a poll about capabilities that uh, and techniques that people really thought were important for the future. Um, and so I think Ellen made that poll. Ellen, do you think you could um, uh, share the poll? And do, do people have to vote in real time in order to, are we gonna hold up Karen's presentation if we do the poll right now? Um, I believe they need to vote in real time, but I'll launch it and- um... Okay. Well, people can respond fairly quickly. It's a multiple choice, so let me launch it. Yeah, let's just do this one so that we don't hold uh, the, the rest of the talk. So I'm gonna answer. <laughs> and you can, you can choose more than one, I believe. Ah. Yeah, since our, since our session was about observations and techniques and diagnostics, we thought it might be fun for, since we talked a lot, for, for the participants to be able to express themselves and say what they needed. And if you choose that you need something else, feel free to put it in the chat, what it is that is really important to, you think is important to making progress on these kinds of topics. 